This screencast is looking at a Lexus PLC example from class. So again, with all these types of financial analysis questions, the first thing you will always do is you're going to focus on a high level review of the financial statements and the information given. So we're given here three financial statements, statement financial position, otherwise known as your balance sheet, your income statement, otherwise known as your P&L, profit and loss account, and then your statement of cash flows. And at the very end, then they ought to give you some additional notes just to give you more information in the question. And if this is an exam level question, I'd give you more narrative as well as to the context in which you're looking at this company. It could be a customer, could be a supplier, could be a banker, could be a shareholder. So always read around the context first before you get into the nitty gritty of the actual ratio calculations. So as discussed in class, I'll just look at some high level points just so you can jot down well, what am I seeing in each of the statements. So high level insights. So we'll just take down a couple just to see well, what are we seeing in this business. Well, firstly, there seems to be an expansion in what we call NCE. So an expansion in non-current assets. So land and buildings have gone up, fixtures and fittings have gone up. And we know if you've read through the question, you can link that to the major refurbishment and the major expansion um, of their new warehouse and distribution center. So there's an expansion there. So they've obviously spent money. Second thing is there's an expansion in what we call a working capital. Now, by working capital, we mean there's money, extra money been tied up in inventory. There's extra money been tied up in trade receivables, and you're using a lot more trade payables. Now, trade payables is good. It's a source of finance. But the other two, if you have money tied up in inventory or money tied up in trade receivables, that's a drain on cash. But as you grow the business, you need to have more inventory on hand. And as you grow your business, you're going to need to give more trade credit, which means you're going to have more trade receivables. So that's your second key insight as you're looking through the question. So just looking for high level things to know, is that consistent with what I'm seeing elsewhere in the question? Third thing is cash decline. You're gone from four positive, I'll just put plus VE for positive, to 76 negative, minus VE for negative. So your cash decline is you're gone from four in the bank to now 76 overdraft, 76 million. So what you're trying to think there is there's clearly a cash squeeze going on. They're using their cash to fund the day-to-day -day business. And you're looking at that in the context of other elements or other moves in the question as well, such as your move in trade payables. So there's been a drain in cash outflow over 2011-2012. So we can see there's some key highlights from the statement financial position. You've also taken on more debt. It's gone up by 100. And you've increased your trade payables significantly. So it looks like you're financing these new investments up the top half in the assets with new debt, but also relying on your overdraft. So you see the mix of how you increase the assets, but also you're increasing your finance sources, which is the bottom half of your statement financial position. Key insight in your P&L then, you're growing revenue, but falling profits. So growing revenue, falling profits. And we can see here the expenses look to be the worrying items. Revenue has gone up by nearly 20%. Gross profit has fallen and net profit has fallen dramatically. So it looks like we're worried expenses have gone up. So we need to investigate why have expenses have gone up by so much. Interest has nearly doubled. And you can see the way I draw the line. Well, if your interest is doubling, that's because you have more debt, number one, but also because now you've an overdraft. And of course, overdraft can be expensive as well. So you're kind of seeing high level, I get the idea now, we're expanding, but maybe we're not as efficient in cost control as we could be. And finally, then your statement of cash flows you're looking at, you're actually losing cash in, operate, in operating activities. It's minus 70. That's coming from you're continuing to pay a dividend, right? You have to pay tax out and you have to pay interest out. So the question is, why would you continue to pay a dividend uh, when you're in this expansion mode? That could be because the shareholders want it. You spend 110 on property plant equipment, and we flagged that already. And you issue loan notes of 100. So overall, there's a decline of 80 in cash, which matches what we said in the statement of financial position. You started off with an opening balance of 4, and now you have a negative balance or an overdraft of 76. So ultimately, this, ca this business is draining cash over the last period. But as you've seen down the bottom here, they tell you that they've expanded rapidly. They've gone up by nearly four or 5,000 employees over the year, and they've expanded 
the warehouse and distribution center. So that may be the case. We may not know, is that fully bedded in yet? So some of these declining profitability, increasing costs may only be temporary. But that's what you have to do for the first four or five minutes is look at the narrative and the question and match that to the high level trends you're seeing in the, the statements that are given. Usually I won't give you the three statements. I'll probably only give you two statements in an exam question. Once you have that done, then in this question, we're going to look through all five pillars in terms of your ratio analysis. So if we go back, your five pillars are profitability, efficiency, liquidity, gearing and investment. Now in an exam, I would direct you to which pillars I look at. I'd very rarely look at all five. It really depends on what context I'm asking you to look at them in. But the first one we're going to look at here is profitability and the performance. So we're going to calculate growth, margins, and then expenses as percentage of sales. So firstly, let's start off, we'll just do a subheading profitability. And the first one we're going to do is your growth and we we'll look at a growth in revenue. So bring up the question here. So your growth and revenue are saying it has grown year on year. And that's going to be equal to this year's revenue divided by last year's revenue minus one. This will give you a good idea. Well, what, what percentage is revenue grown? So in this case, you're saying the growth and revenue year on year. I get it to work. Is about 20%. 19.6% is your revenue growth. Now that's a useful one to look at because then you can match that to, well, what is the growth in the expenses? Because if expenses are growing quicker than revenue, you're going to have a problem with profitability. So you can also apply that formula, current year divided by prior year minus one, to any line item. So it's a useful one to use. So growth, for example, in OPEX. OPEX is your operating expenses. They have gone 362 this year, 252 last year, minus 1. So we're saying, well, what have they grown year on year? So if we do that calculation out, they've actually grown 43, 44%. So that already highlights a big problem, which you could make a note of in your commentary, is expenses are growing quicker than revenue. Now, that could be the case because it may only be temporary, but they're the points you have to highlight in the question. Is growth of expenses even look at interest payable, has nearly grown 100%. It's nearly doubled year on year. So that's where the problems are, is expenses are growing quicker than revenue. And finally, then we look at the growth of your profits. So we'll just look at, for example, net profit. It's actually, it's not, it's not growth here, it's negative growth, which is a decline. It's 11 over 165 minus one. So this actually means it's a decline. And it's declined to the tune of 93%. So it's gone down by 93% year on year. So that would be a big concern. Your profitability has fallen off a cliff. Whether that's temporary or not, we don't know. We need more information before we can make a solid conclusion on that. So growth, we can't do growth for 2011 because we don't have 2010 figures. So you always need two-year figures to do. So we've just done growth for 2012. But ultimately, we are growing significantly, 20%. But the problem is revenue is growing less than costs. And that's contributing to our declining um, profitability. We'll then look at some margin figures. Now, you can do margin on a number of levels. Gross profit margin, operating profit, net profit. We'll just do gross and net. I will ask specifically in the exam question which ones I want you to look at. So we'll call this GPM. And we'll call it NPM, or net profit margin. And we'll look at 2011 and 2012. Now note, some of the questions in the newer versions might say 2014, 2015. It's the same question overall, so don't be too concerned about that. So our gross profit margin will be gross profit, 495, over revenue. Now it's multiplied by 100 over 1. That's just to get in a percentage form. So here... The gross profit margin in 2011 will be about 22%. So we'll put that in percentage form. So about 22.1% in 2011. And again, ideally, you'd want to compare that to an external benchmark as well to see how far off you are your peers. In 2012, 
gross profit has actually declined, whereas revenue has gone up. So straight away we know this is going to be lower than last year because we're earning less revenue or less profits on more revenue. And the, the gross profit margin that year was gone down to 15%. So that's a significant decline year on year because usually gross profit margin should be somewhat static. So that's the thing that will be concerning you and you may be making comment as to, well, what's driving that? There's two possible reasons. Either our cost of sales has deteriorated and we're spending more money or perhaps our pricing has deteriorated and we're, we're, we're reducing the price we charge just to get the higher volume. But again, we, do, we need more information before we can make a conclusion there. Net profit then will be 165 over 2240 and it'll be here 11 over 2681 the same logic each time you will be asked specific ones to calculate so that's we've gone here 11 over 2681 for the year and this one will be bring it down about seven so your net profit percentage there will be 7.4 and 0.4%. So it just depends which one you're doing. You can do operating profit if you want as well. I just did net profit for a different one. So net profit was about 7.5% last year. It's completely fallen off a cliff this year. All right. So there's plenty of variation of which margins you do. Just make sure you can know that margin is a profit figure over the revenue figure. But in both, it suggests that... Um, your profitability has significantly declined and the big concern probably is going to be your operating expenses because they have a dramatic fall off on operating profit. It is a fall off here, but not as significant in terms of essentially one seventh is your profitability less now um, is a big concern. And that suggests your expenses and your interest are contributing to that. So you need to get a breakdown of what those expenses are uh, and see what's driving that a big increase. So that's your first half of your profitability metrics. The other ones we look at are profitability with respect to the money invested in the business. So these are what we call your return metrics as well. Either return on capital employed, which looks at return to both shareholders and your banks, your debt holders, or just to shareholders, which is often known as return on shareholders funds or return on equity. So our first one we're going to look at here is your ROC. And that's going to be operating profit, 243, divided by your capital employed, which is your long-term debt, 200, plus your long-term equity, 563. Now, just note, one of the reasons in your notes that you are given other information about last year's equity and last year's non-current liabilities is technically, to be fair, you should be really looking at the average capital employed over the year. Because you're looking at the profitability over a year, whereas we're looking at the capital employed at the end of the year. So that's not necessarily a fair comparison. You should really be comparing the profit over the year to the capital employed over the year. So sometimes we can use averages if you have the information. For AC548 and for exam purposes, end of year figures are fine. But you can use averages uh, if the information is available. So that's why they give you 2010 figures there, just so you can calculate the averages for both years. But it's not required for our purpose. So that's for the last year. And for this year, then, it will be 47 over. Your debt has gone up to 300 and your equity is 534 now. And it's just to make sure you understand it. capital employed is your long term, i.e. non-current debt plus your equity, which is also known as your shareholder funds. 31% last year. However, it's fallen now to 5% this year. So again, a big fall off in your return on capital employed, and that will be a worry for shareholders. Two things are driving that. First thing is fall off in profitability. So of course, your top line figure has dropped dramatically. But also, you now have more capital because you're taking on debt and you're not earning a return on that either. So that would be a concern. The question then is whether it's temporary or whether it's a more permanent decline. The other one then as we're calculating is ROSF can also be called ROE, which is return on equity. This is return just on your shareholders. So here you're looking for the profit after tax, which is 165 over 563. 
So that's just your equity and just your return profit after tax, which is just available to shareholders. And last year, or this year, should I say it's 11 over 534. So here then, your oral return on shareholders fund is 2%. And last year, it was up at 29%. So again, that even signifies a more dramatic decline. When you strip out the return the bank earns, you're saying it's gone from return on equity of 29% down to 2.1%. So you have to watch for that. That would be a big concern if you're a shareholder, potential shareholder is, well, is this just a once-off or should I be expecting lower returns year on year? And that's a question you should be raising if you're looking for more information about Alexis's performance in 2012. So that's looking at the area of profitability. And again, typically in a question, I will tell you two or three ratios to calculate, but then you have to give comments as well. So you'll be talking about the deterioration of profitability and linking that to possibly the, ref the expansion and the new distribution center, which may need time to bet in. So our next pillar then we're looking at is this thing called efficiency. So how efficient are you with looking or working in the business? And typically we look at working capital management. So it's your cash conversion cycle, the different working capital days. How long does it take your customers to pay you? How long does the inventory on hand before it's sold? And how long does it take you to pay your suppliers? So we're going to calculate these three efficiency ratios. So the first one we're going to look at is your trade receivable days. Sometimes this is known as DSO, day sales outstanding. So it's on average, how long does it take your customers to pay you? Ideally, you want this low because you want cash coming in from your customers quickly. And the formula is your trade receivables divided by your sales times 365. Now, there are variations in that formula that you could say you should take average trade receivables for the year by taking opening and closing and dividing by two. For our purpose, we're happy to take end of year. So don't be too concerned about that. We'll take end of year. So that's going to be, on average, how long does it take your customers to pay you? About 39 days. So about 39 days, on average, is how long it takes your customers to pay you. And you'll be looking for questions then, well, what's my trade receivable policy? Is my policy 30 days? Or maybe my policy is 20 days? And then you're asking, well, why is it still taking longer? Am I poor credit control in the business? So I will always give you guides in the question whether that's a good or bad figure. Your trade receivable days then for this year are 273 divided by 2681 times 365. So has it gone up or down? Has trade receivable management improved or disimproved? It's actually improved slightly. So that'd be a positive. So you're not too concerned about that. You're saying in around the same 39 days on average, 37 days on average. And all you'd want to do is compare that to an industry benchmark to see, is that completely out of whack? But generally, the movement there, the increase in trade receivables, is somewhat matching the increase in revenue. So there's nothing too um, worrisome about that. Inventory days is the next thing we're looking at. This is, on average, how long does it take us to sell our inventory? And the formula is your inventory which is two, 300 last year, divided by, in this case, you're going to be dividing by, excuse me, your cost of sales, 1745 times 365. So it's inventory over cost of sales times 365. So we come back then. And next year, or this year, should I say, it's inventory, it's gone up significantly, it's now gone to 406. But so has our cost of sales. It's gone to 2272. So we're essentially looking at the relationship between an inventory figure and cost of sales. That's what a ratio is, looking at relationships between figures. So here the average inventory days is 62. And for this year, the average inventory days is gone to 65. So it's deteriorated slightly. Now, in the overall scheme of things, you wouldn't be as concerned because it's a carpet business as you're told up here. But if that was fruit and veg or something and it's taken two months, that'd be a big concern because you could have a lot of gone off stock or obsolete stock. 
but in general it's gone up slightly so it has deteriorated but only in a small proportion so it's not a huge swing that you might see in other questions and the last one then is what we call our trade payable days sometimes known as dpo days purchases outstanding and there's variation in this formula again you can use averages the one we use in ac548 is trade payables over cost of sales times 365. so here our trade payables are 261 in 2011 over 1745 times 365. and this year we know our trade payables have increased dramatically they're gone to 354 over 2272 times 365. So this tells us on average how long does it take us to pay our suppliers. So there it's taking us 54 days. Here it's taking us 56 days. So we're taking slightly longer to pay on average. Not a, ma not a major movement. You will see bigger movements in some exam questions. But again, we just want to watch for that because it may be the case that, as we've highlighted in class, the reason trade payables are increasing is not because we've negotiated better terms with our trade payables. It's that, in fact, we can't pay because we're in an overdraft position and we have a cash squeeze going on. So you need to watch those working capital management days. Ideally, the lower trade receivable days, the lower inventory days, the better, with the caveat that you have to give some credit in most industries and you have to have some inventory on hand to make sales. And at the opposite for trade payables, the bigger the better, with the caveat that if you take too long, you'll annoy your suppliers, you'll lose the goodwill, and therefore you may not get those supply, supply lines again. So that's some of your efficiency, efficiency metrics. There are other bespoke ones depending on the question. So for example, here, one very useful one could have been revenue over sales. Or revenue, should I say, over the number of people employed. So you could look at revenue per employee. Just as another metric of how efficient we are. Some airlines, for example, might look at revenue per plane. You could still look at, for example, Lidl and Aldi and Tesco might look at revenue per employee as well. How efficient are we at the number of employees we're employed to generate revenue? So, for example, last year, it would be 2240 divided by 13995 employees. Now, just to make sure that's a millions. So, 2240 million. And three more zeros. So, it's 2240 billion. So that will come, just to make sure I've got my zeros right. So it's about 160,000 per employee. So just make sure you get the zeros right because the numbers are rounded. You want to make sure you interpret it. About 160,000 per employee. That's how efficient we were in terms of generating revenue from last year. Whereas this year, I'll just show you the zeros again. It's 2681. That's millions, and this is actually billions, and you're dividing by 18623. So we have a huge increase in our employees this year. So just bring this to see, can you see the calculations? So it's a significant increase this year in employees. And we want to see well, what's the revenue per employee now? The revenue per employee is about 143. So you have fallen in terms of your efficiency year on year. Now you're only earning about 143 grand per employee. Now a good student will say, well, that's probably temporary. We made a huge increase here. They're probably not all in for the full year. And they're probably going to take a year or two to bed them in to get our new warehouse and distribution center up and running. But there can be different tailor-made efficiency metrics that you look at for different industries. But the three main ones we want you to focus on are the working capital calculations, trade receivable days, inventory days, and trade payable days. So the next um, perspective we're going to look at is liquidity. Now, remember, liquidity is about the ability to meet your short-term obligations. It's really about your cash position. Have your cash on hand to meet your debts as they fall due in the short term. And our high-level review of this business early on looked like there was a cash squeeze going on. 
you've gone from four positive cash to 76 negative. You're having a big increase in your trade payables as well. So it looks like liquidity could be an issue on the short term. So the longer term is about solvency and gearing, but the shorter term we're looking at, will this company have enough cash to pay its debts as it falls due? Liquidity. And we look at two ratios here. We look at the current ratio, and we look at something called the asset test, otherwise known as the quick ratio. So these are kind of benchmarks of what's your liquidity position. But again, don't jump straight to the ratios. Always look at the high level position. What's your cash movement? We're now gone overdraft. And we'd want to know well, what's our overdraft limit. Because if it's anywhere near 76, you're going to be in a very precarious liquidity position. Likewise, you can see the extension of your trade payables suggests you're leaning on your trade payables as a source of finance as well, which can be tricky if they pull the plug. So your current ratio, how that's calculated, is current assets divided by current liabilities. So it looks at the relationship between your short-term assets and your short-term liabilities. So in 2011, it was 544 divided by 291. Current assets, which is the subtotal here, and current liabilities. So the relationship there is 1.8 is to 1. Now, the ideal benchmark is somewhere around 2 is to 1. But in most exam questions, I will give you an industry benchmark that you compare off. But usually you want 2 is to 1, twice as many short-term assets as short-term liabilities. In 2012, it is 679. Just make sure you take the right subtotal for current assets. The 1266 is total assets. That's current and non-current added together divided by, and we have an increase here up to 432. So although our current assets have increased slightly, our current liabilities have increased dramatically. That's down to increase in payables and your increase in your overdraft. So that's deteriorated from 1.87 down to 1.57. So what we'd say there is liquidity has deteriorated and you're well below the benchmark of 2 is to 1. So you only now have a euro 50 in assets for every euro in liabilities, short-term liabilities that you have. Now, what the asset test of the quick ratio looks at is it's a more severe test of liquidity because it says actually some of those assets are not liquid. You can't convert them into cash very quickly, so they may be no good for actually uh, paying liabilities. So the quick ratio looks at, it says take the current assets but take off your inventory on the basis that inventory is not a liquid asset you may not be able to convert that into cash quickly so it's a quicker test of liquidity and the benchmark here is one is to one so you, all you're doing is taking off your inventory and saying it's current assets less inventory so in this case it's 304 and sorry i took off the wrong one there that's my fault you should take off 300 is your inventory and that will leave you with a quick ratio of 0.83 so already you're below the benchmark of one is to one i.e. you want one euro liquid assets to one euro liquid liabilities and for previous 2012 will be 679 minus 406 divided by 432 so your quick ratio or your asset test last year the same thing is 0.63 so your quick ratio has deteriorated as well you now only have 63 cent in I suppose, what we call liquid assets the ability to convert into cash relatively quickly for every euro you have in short-term liabilities so as well as a high level idea that liquidity has deteriorated by the movement in cash we also have our ratios to suggest both ratios have deteriorated and you would have concerns about the short-term liquidity position of this business. The ability to meet their short-term obligations as they fall due. So our next pillar that we're looking at now is gearing. So the two main ones we look at is the gearing ratio. And what essentially the gearing is, what percentage of your capital is in the form of debt? So not dissimilar to looking at your LTV when you look at a mortgage is, what percentage of the funding you use is in debt form? The higher the percentage, the higher your gearing, and the higher your financial risk. And the other big one we look at is interest cover is operating profit over your interest expense. How sustainable is your interest? How affordable is it? 
So these are very important, not only for businesses, but also for personal finance in the form of your mortgage. So we're looking here at your gearing, and we said another word for gearing could be leverage or could be your debt. So this is looking at your more longer term, the financial sustainability of your business. So we have a gearing ratio, and we have this thing called interest cover. One looks at what percentage debt do you have in your business. The other looks at how affordable is your interest payments each year. So gearing, the formula is debt, which last year was 200, over debt plus equity. So it's the total capital in the business, which is 763. 563 plus 200. What percentage of that is in debt? So last year, our gearing ratio would have been 26%. So 26% of our funding was in the form of debt. And this year, it's going to be, well, it's probably going to be increased because we've now taken on more debt. So 300 over 300 plus 534. So your gearing ratio in 2012 is actually gone up to 35%. So there's an increase in gearing because we've taken on more debt. So that's understandable. And ideally, you'd want to benchmark then off an industry because different industries have more acceptable debt levels. Certain industries which have a lot of assets and very stable cash flows can take on more debt. So it's not to say that a certain benchmark is the same for every industry. You have to look at industry peers and we'll always give you that in the question. But generally lower than 50% is seen kind of lowly geared or at least uh, it's not a high level of gearing. So you're not too concerned about that so far, but you would like to see an industry average. Your, in, your interest cover then is slightly different. This is looking at what cover do we have to pay our interest each year. And the formula there is your operating profit, which is profit before interest in tax, 243, divided by your interest, which is 18. And in 2012, it's because profits have fallen, it's 47 divided by 32. So your interest cover last year would have been 13.5. Now, how we say that is times. So our profits were 13.5 times our interest. So there was a load of cover there. We have plenty of affordability in terms of our interest payments each year. However, when you come to this year, you now only have 1.5 times cover. So that would be a big concern because you're just about covering your interest. Any increase in interest or any decrease in profitability means you may not have enough profits to pay off your interest. So what you're saying there is significant decline in interest cover, and that would be a concern both to shareholders, but also to the bank. He's saying this may be a riskier proposition going forward. Now a good student might highlight that temporary, this could be a temporary decline, that if we improve our overdraft position, the interest expense will go down. And if we bed in our new expansion, our profitability hopefully will go up as well that this may be just a one-off item and it may be in the future, this will normalize to a higher level. But that's what a student has to identify of, that this may be a one-off, but if it's not, then a number of stakeholders will be concerned. And our last pillar now we're looking at is the pillar of investment ratios. So these are ratios that investors will look at because again, they're looking at, is this an attractive company? Is it earning enough? How much should I pay for a share in the business? And how much dividend is paying? Because remember, investors are either going to get it returned through increased share price or they're going to get it through dividends. So that's what they're concerned about is profitability, how much to pay for a share, i.e. what it's worth, and also then dividend cover. And how sustainable is the dividend that's been paid? And these are key metrics. As you've seen in class, we look at the Financial Times. You, they give the metrics for every listed company. And they're key metrics that are used to benchmark the, the attractiveness of one share against another. So the investment ratios. First one we're looking at is EPS, earnings per share. So this takes profit after tax divided by the number of shares. So we have our profit figures here. And the number of shares here, just be careful. You have 300 million share capital. That's how much money has been put into the business by the shareholders. But each share has a nominal value or what we call an accounting value of 50 cent. So that means, now just be careful, that means there's 600 million shares. Because 600 million shares 
times 50 cent each gets your accounting value of 300 million euro. These are euro figures. We want the number of shares. So it's 165 over 600 million. So both are millions. And then this year it's 11 over 600 million. Just be careful there, your calculations. It's 600 million shares because each share is only worth 50 cents in terms of accounting value. Their market value is separate. When the accounting, we, we record them what they call their nominal value as per their, their legal documents. So therefore, the earnings per share last year were 27 and a half cents. This year, they're actually only one cent. So that's a dramatic decline. And that's what investors are looking at is, is that a normal decline? to expect it, or is that just a once-off because there's more betting in issues? So if you're a listed company and you're recording declines like that, you're going to get hammered in your share price. So that suggests that the investors will be concerned. Why is there such a dramatic fall-off unless you have a viable story about what's going on? So earnings per share is a very important metric. And as you'll see, you go and look at Google Financial Times Ryanair, Financial Times Greencore, earnings per share is one of the first metrics to look at. But another key metric which links the price of a share to the earnings per share is the PE ratio. So it's often called the PE multiple. I, what multiple of earnings are you paying for each share? So we have the market price the shares given here. They were trading at 250 last year and now they're trading at 150. So that gives an indication that the market is not happy with the performance. The share price has fallen by a euro over the year. So again, the fall in profitability suggests that the market is not happy. So last year, they were willing to pay two euro 50 for shares that were earning 27 and a half cent. So what multiple of earnings were you willing to pay for each share? So last year, they were willing to pay about nine times earnings, 9.1 times earnings. So that's what your PE multiple is. And you can compare that then to other companies in the same industry. So if you're comparing airlines, you compare it to another airline, retailers to another retailer. Because this is how attractive this business is to a particular investor. This year, it's fallen to 150 over 0 0.01833. So your price earnings is 81 times. All right, so depending how you're around there, you might get a slightly different one. Now think about that. At a high level, you might think, well, surely that's good. That means investors are now willing to pay 81 times earnings instead of nine times earnings last year. So it looks like we're more attractive to investors. So this is where you have to be very careful with interpreting ratios. Essentially, what this means is it looks like investors see this fall in earnings as being temporary. So they're really not paying 81 times earnings. They're, they're paying 150 because they expect the normal earnings maybe to be somewhere around 10 cent or 15 cent. So a price earnings ratio is used as, I suppose, a signal of the, the confidence that investors have in the business. So it's not that the investors have huge confidence they're willing to pay 80 times earnings. It's that they know that this is a, an unusually low one and that they're pricing for the future. So they're not pricing for a normal one cent per share, earnings per share. They know this is temporary. So that gives you a good indication, a good student will pick that up, that that gives us more evidence that even the market and investors expect this to be a temporary blip in profits. That's why the share price is maintained at 150. Now note, they still expect to fall in profits because that's where the share price has fallen, but they don't expect it to be as severe as we see in the p &L. That just looks to be worn off as it's been bedded in. So go and look at some PE multiples. Look at the PE ratio of Ryanair. Compare that to EasyJet. Look at the PE ratio of a Tesco. And compare that to the PE ratio of some of the UK listed retailers. And try and get an idea, why would they be different? Is there different growth stories? Is there different profit figures? That there might be more behind it than just a simple ratio. So just be careful when you're interpreting ratios. There's a lot more than just looking at the high level figure. Then we're on to our dividends. So we have a dividend per share. So dividend per share is a key metric that investors look at if they want a regular dividend. Our dividend has been maintained at 40 million each year over 600. So they're paying the same dividend out each year. 
Even though they might be struggling for cash, they have maintained the dividend. And you'll see that's a very important decision that you'll study in business finance next year is the question around dividend policy. That if you cut dividends or move them dramatically, that can spook investors. They like steady dividends each year. And the dividend you're paying each year is about six cent per share. So you're maintaining that dividend even in lower profitability years. You may say, well, I'm not cutting my dividend now because actually it's only a temporary blip in profits. And I don't want to spook my shareholders because if you cut the dividend, like Carillion PLC would have done when they were struggling, like AIB and Bank of Ireland would have done in the, in the recession when they were struggling, that spooks investors. And it could send a signal to the market um, that bad times are ahead, even though that may not be the case. So watch for the signal a dividend change could send, particularly when you're a listed company. Then the other ratio we can look at is the thing called dividend cover. So this is similar to interest cover in that we're worried about how sustainable is our dividend payment? Do we have enough profits to pay it? So last year, it's going to be the 165 over the 40. So in that case, you paid 14 million dividends out of profit of 165, you had about four times cover. So in that case, you're happy enough. Right, you have plenty of cover there, four times, even a small fall in profits, you'd still be able to afford the dividend. But look at this year. This year now, you only had 11 million profits and you still paid your 40. So actually you didn't have enough profits this year to pay your dividends. You had only about a quarter of the profits to pay that dividend. So what the company is doing there is they're paying it out of reserve from previous years. So actually pay, they're paying it out of their reserves, not their ongoing profit year on year. So you'll either say that's risky because you may not have that every year, or it could give you the indication that the company has the confidence that this is a temporary blip. They don't want to cut their dividends because they know they're going to be back to more normal profit levels in the future. So again, another indication that this is not a permanent decline. And the final one then is you have something called dividend yield. This looks at what percentage of the share price is paid out as dividend each year. So this gives you a comparison. If I spend a euro fifty on a share, how much percentage of that money am I getting back as an annual payment? So dividend yield, when you look at companies like Greencore or Glanbia or Kerry Group, is an important metric. The higher the dividend yield, the more attractive it is to certain investors who want a regular dividend payment. So dividend yield last year was the dividend per share, 0 0.0666, over the price per share, which is 2.5. So the dividend yield last year was about 2.6%. That's what your dividend yield was. You're getting a return on the share price, about 2.7% each year. Whereas this year, it's going to be 0 0.0666 over 1.5. So it's actually going to increase. And again, that's the danger of looking at ratios in isolation. It's not that the dividend has increased. The main reason the dividend yield has gone up is that the share price has fallen. So watch for how you interpret ratios. A high level, it can seem one way that, oh God, the dividend must have gone up. If the dividend yield has gone up, it's actually the share price that has fallen. So ratios are very useful. They're very important in terms of analyzing a set of companies, financial statements. But if you don't know the limitations and you don't know how they can move, you can interpret them incorrectly. Right. So that is looking at um, Alexis PLC, the in-class example. And we looked across five different pillars. Your first step is to do a high level overview and then make sure you know the key ratios across the five and be able to calculate them which is the first thing, and then be able to interpret them in the context of the question that's given.